Goeien oore Nel, hoe lyk het in Johannesburg? Prachtige sonskyn, rechte Johannesburg weer, wat my altyd gelukkig maak. Hoe lyk het in die kaap? <laughs> Dit is natterig in die kaap en um, ja, I suppose I must uh, admit that I'm shivering here in my cold studio and I really wish I could be next to that long heater that we always sit next to together. So for the sake of us being together with other people, I don't actually think we've ever sat down with them before. And so I don't think they know how we have become friends or the nature of our relationship. Um, do you want to do the honors? <laughs> Robert, I remember, I remember when the first time we spoke about one of your pictures, it was with one of your friends. It was a beautiful morning. It was raining, but it was still lovely. And I remember some little ducks swimming in the water or puddling, playing in the water on the tiles in front of the place where we were sitting. And you just immediately followed what I wanted to say. Now, that is so rare. From that moment on, well, for me, we clicked. I don't know what you <laughs> felt. <laughs> I know. I, I, was, I had met up with you because I was going to build your first website. And, um, and I, a typical in my style of not really knowing how to attach a monetary value to something, I asked you if you would give me some feedback on my, on my work. And I, I thought it might be a difficult thing because I'm a photographer and you're a painter, but then there was that moment that you just described where we, yeah, we found the, I don't know, the universality of art, I suppose, between our different mediums. You know, these things just come together and happen at the right moment, or they don't. It's happened before with Frank too. He saw a picture, he liked it, he bought it, and there you are. It's happened yeah, like that with, with a few people, and that's wonderful, yeah. Yes. And subsequently I asked you to mentor me and you said no. Yes, because I'm not a born teacher. I can't, let me rather say, a teacher I'm not, and an educator I'm certainly not, but I'd prefer to be the second. I don't know, it's for you to judge. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, it's been, um, I mean, uh, that's, I think it's so, it's been 20 years that we've been in this conversation. That we've been in this conversation. Yes, and... it's more, it's more. It was before 2002 when you left for America. Yes, yes. Yes. And so I think we both at that time didn't really know. Um, I think our, our connection was spiritual. It wasn't, it wasn't of such a nature that I could say, well, you've got to, you've got to teach me how to do composition. <laughs> that wasn't going to be the relationship between us. Our exploration of our work was more about what's going on here in our work. That may be, Robert, but I do remember that first incident with that one picture that we looked at. One picture, for me, made all the difference. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right, so we are tasked with a job to talk about the spiritual in art. And also, I see somebody has added that um, I have to, we have to talk about your personal life. Well, I don't, su I suppose... It does come in, but that's automatic. We don't have to worry much about it, I think. But do ask what you wanted to ask. But I suppose that is the link. The, the spiritual is often very private. And it's the thing that, that links up all our aspects of ourselves. I guess so, because in, in painting, it certainly links up all together with the forms and the shapes that I do make. It just happened like that. I didn't plan it so. You know, things just happen. And then you become aware of them afterwards. Usually not before you plan them. I mean, not before you plan them, not before you do them. Afterwards, when you've done something, then maybe you start planning and start thinking, and then the next thing arises. But, you know, talking about the spiritual art, you remember what Elsa Miles said? She watched 
she watched painting all her life and she watched my first exhibition at a university, which I think it was the first, I don't remember, in 1972 at Witt in the Wartenweiler Library. And there she said that there was much spiritual in art and she said that she wouldn't classify me as an abstract artist because I take my lead from things in nature and then change them into metaphors. And you see about the metaphors, she, she stressed that about spirituality. But we'll come to the point, what is the spirituality in art? What is it? We'll come to it. <laughs> you ask. <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> well, I mean, so in the last year, we've been busy making, uh, writing together about your journey and making, uh, making books about it and choosing images to go with the themes that we, are, we have started seeing. You're very right. And we worked very hard on those lamps and, book and, and boats that we... Well, we thought it was ready for publication, and then we decided we could improve on it. Huh? <laughs> you remember <laughs> that? <laughs> well, I mean, we're enjoying the editing process too much. Oh, it was lovely. Um, it is lovely, yes. yes. But what I, th what I think for me has been a, r a very important realization in the, last year, in the last year is this very satisfying feeling that you are having that you can, in retrospect, for the first time, understand what it is you've been busy with. Do you want to talk a bit about how that realization comes around? Like, what is it that you've been busy with all this time? That, Robert. <laughs> all these is, seven decades. Yeah, that's probably one of the big advantages of <laughs> growing old, because it has its problems. But, um, yes, it is. I think I've said that before, it is just since 2018, when I look back at the French influence, when I was asked to do it, then things started, I felt like writing it down, and I wrote down all that I remembered. And here and there looked up something I'd forgotten. And, and then I could, I could really see how many of the things I struggled with for years were actually there in embryo ach, in, the, in, the, in the 50s. And they were there, but I didn't see them. And so it is. I think it's, yeah, it's Rumi that says, you see, in, in a work of art, a poem, whatever, in any work of art, you see that there are forms within forms and the one form is for the other and it leads to the other because these things were there, their seeds were there, but how to use them, then they matured. For instance, later on I painted germination. Where does it come from? I can now look back. It became a metaphor for the movement, the growth movement, because I was all into energy. You remember? I think I told you. You know that. So the energy is in the fact that it grows. And then I take it on various subjects, like the human body. That's always, the prefer for me, the pref preferred one, because it is so rich, it just keeps on giving. And then I take it from the body, for instance, and maybe another subject until that's exhausted. And then the next thing wants to be painted. So it changes. But it's always that energy, search for energy, for movement, movement, motion. Like you remember, we spoke about the Cubists and they wanted that movement. And so I, then that's when I started going back to them that I discovered all the movements in the body. They would twist, they would stretch, they would reach out. Oh, it's endless. So that's what I, I wanted to ask you. I mean, the, the, the themes that we've highlighted in your, in, um, in your work while we've been working in your studio, separating out the different subjects, we found um, a series of what we're calling flight, 
a series um, of horses, um, a series of, of, of human bodies, a series of, uh, there's, there's a small series of kites. And I suppose the thing that's been really hard for me to do is to not see those series by the objects that are in them. In other words, those horse series is not about horses. It's not a study in horses. The series about birds, it's not a study in birds. And the series where there's a crab and, 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 and a kite coming, it's not about crabs and about, um, about uh, kites. What, and and it's took, take me so, taken me so long and listening to so many conversations with you to understand that you were interested in the energy that's moving inside of all those objects. And you, what you've taught me is that that's art language, to call those things objects and not bodies. Yes, indeed, because if, I, if you look at the thing, I'd want you to see that motion, that movement, that energy, that power that works through it, because it's a wonderful power. It's continuous, it's a concept, we can't touch it, it's immaterial, but we can observe it. So now try and paint something about that, it's very difficult. But I've found, as I think I've said before, that if you want to paint motion, you've got to find another technical language. And that's why it became, the technique became virtually the content of the picture, how you do it, what you employ. And in my case, via cubism, I realized that I've broken the object, I've got to break into space. And the moment you do that, you've got two things talking to one another. Now they're active. Now the background's no longer that cool, cold, unresponsive thing just sitting there to receive apples and pears and people and other things. It has now become a talking thing. It talks to the what is left of the object because the object's broken. Something's left of it. It should become a proper sign. Oh, that's another field. You work on these signs for... <laughs> For, for, for years, okay. and you never satisfy. I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you now because us mere mortals can't always follow. I have the luxury of 20 years of conversations with you, but um, I'd like to focus on a word that you just said. You talked about technique. The technique, and I want to bring to everybody that's sitting with us here that in your mentorship of me. I often became frustrated because you don't ask me for my artist statement. You don't ask me, what is this work about? You know, you would look at something like this work behind me and I would want to talk about patriarchy and capitalism and um, the black body. And you would not be interested in any of it. And I would be really frustrated. And, and one day I just confronted you straight and I was like, why don't you ask me what I'm trying to say? Robert, you're what, quite right in telling the story, but you're not quite right in saying I wasn't interested in anything else. <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm getting <laughs> oh, to the no. point. I'm getting to the point. Oh, no. And eventually, because, you know, you're just being skellum like you always do. You teach me in skellum ways. And eventually you said it to me one day. You opened up a work and you didn't say to me, move anything. You didn't say, ask me any questions like, why is the dot not sitting here or the body not sitting on the right? You said to me, what is this work about? <laughs> and it was the first time. And I said, why is this work different than other works? And you said to me, well, there's no technique missing. You have gotten all the balances right. And now I can relax and it can flow to me. And I'm wondering, what is it that you're trying to say to me? And yes, I suppose that is the struggle that you have with your own work and also in, in teaching me is when you get the technique right, the story, the narrative, the spirituality of the work will just flow to the viewer, right? Quite so. If your shapes, if your forms are in good relationship with your old background, which has now, in my mind, become an active thing, and in your work, in any work, 
that is of major importance and that then um, yeah then you can talk about the content once you you've got those things in place ha ah, now you relax now let me pull the content out of it i think do you want to, do you follow what i'm trying to say I hope. I hope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I suppose I think this is what I've observed of you and all the time that I've known is that you were so busy with struggling with that with yourself that you often didn't know yourself what it was you were doing. But in recent the year, you are happy with your technique and you are now can see what it is that you've been doing over all these years. And you are able to relate it to me and all this writing that 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 we're doing. Can I read a little bit of of what we what we yes um, please uh, what, on Saturday? Yeah, let's hear. So here it says, uh, "I paint in the manner that I do, because I want us all to enjoy the creation. There is so much more to see in it than just recognizing things and moving on." We all use our eyes to recognize things and then we stop looking. We feel we recognize and understand what we're looking at and then we're mostly satisfied. So maybe you'd like to pick up from there, like what it is that we're supposed to then be doing if we're not just recognizing objects. Well, you know, this morning I just happened to have the radio on and it was actually about, not politics, but, well, the lack of, 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 of service in the um, local authorities. And the person then said, it's like a work of art. I mean, it, you, you don't just look at it. It must challenge you. So I think that challenge, that has something to do with your question. Just, just refresh your question to me, because I was so impressed by what this man said. So I forgot. <laughs> Well, basically, I mean, we just use our eyes to recognize objects. And often art is admired for being able to relay an object to somebody. But you are trying to say to us, don't just recognize it. The artwork has to do more than just look at the object. There's more in an artwork, in your artwork, than an object. Yes, I think. I think in, in the things that I've been doing, there are two ways. The one is you look at the, at the movement, the motion, and, what, and that it's actually a continuous stream going through. We'll talk about that later, a stream of energy. And at the same time, Elsa Miles said the right words, things change. The original subject which you started with, the thing, the thing you started with from nature, that changes into a metaphor. So you see there are two aspects. That's why the lamp also became, I think, a metaphor. So the lamp, the lamp as a metaphor. So do you, I mean, are you willing to talk a bit about the pain that you were, the, the, the pain in your life at that time when you were painting the lamp? These things always associate <laughs> because uh, yeah, you, that lamp was, was such a, a globe of light. It was like the moon rising and it was wonderful and beautiful and it had reflections and so on. But then uh, that lamp also got, got extinguished, the light of it. And um, yeah, and, 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 and so it became a metaphor for, 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 for struggle. Your lament in, in, in that, that, we, that we mostly use our eyes as just recognizing objects. Um, you said this to me, beyond this kind of just simply recognizing and moving on, there is an infinite abstract world where the finest and boldest forces and currents of nature meet. I look at nature and I want to distill it make us see what lies behind, beyond and behind where the recognizing eye usually stops. Okay, that sounds very short, but that took us a month to get to that distillation. <laughs> to distill, to take it away, to take, because that's what abstract art's about, although I'm not a pure abstract painter. It is to take the material away from the immaterial. I looked it up in the dictionary because I thought I better do. 
And that is exactly what it means. All right, so what I want to know from you is that here you are doing abstract art and you want us to see the energy that moves through these bodies that are present in your work, these metaphors. We've decided that these bodies, the, the birds and the horses, that they metaphors. That's what you shared with us a moment ago, right? And so you want us to not look just at the metaphor. You don't want us to just see a horse. You want us to see the motion inside of the horse. Your words were this. Let's consider the horse in this way. Find the mind and the spirits, its character inside of the body. The horse lives to run. Drawing and painting this motion reflect something of the inner and the intangible aspects of the horse. I want us to see this. But now I want, to, I want you to tell us, what do you do with these bodies so that we can have this experience? Do you, how do you make us see it? What are you doing? Do you break them apart or do you, what do you do? Yeah, you see, you have to, abstract is the important word. You have to strip it, to make it abstract. Take the, the material away from the immaterial. That's no joke. I mean, <laughs> it really is something that takes a long, long time. And in my case, I followed the lines which indicated energy to me. But abstraction is so important to come to the simplicity of things. And now I go back to your question, and that is, behind nature there is a whole abstract blueprint of shapes and forms that link and correspond and and, and and actually converse sometimes with one another. And that is a beautiful abstract world on which this nature is built. And it is it's a very rewarding exercise to try and delve into it and discover these relationships and these, these bonds that there exist in the things that we see. But we can only begin if we're open to abstracting, taking away as much of it as we can to try and find an essential. Okay, so the painting that's sitting right behind you there. Please tell us, what is the metaphor there? Is it a human body that you, that you departed with that is behind you? Yes, that was, that's the, the Alpha Mother. The giver. You see her head is right up there between the nourishing breasts. Her head is small. It's not of importance to her. Giving is everything for her. Her thighs come up like two mountains. And in between that physical support, there is the whole desert between the top and the bottom of the body. There is this wasteland, but they are linked because there's a, there's a straight line that goes up actually where from the back, that would be the spine. So it's very, very centered and anchored, but it is full and it's giving all the time. That's what I saw in the body. Having traveled in the desert, these two things came together and giving was the result. And when we come wow, to, so the, to the abstract... So you're telling me that that painting behind you is a woman's body in the desert? Yeah, it comes from a, whim, from a, whim, a woman's body and a trip to the desert. <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> to you. <laughs> and, and so basically what I'm seeing is that, I mean, you said you don't want, to, want us to use our eyes to just rec recognize an object. And so what you had to do is you break open the lines of these metaphors, which the bodies that are just metaphors, you break them open and, and you change their meaning. I mean, if you've never explained that painting to me before. And so to tell me now that those, those curves are actually her breasts and that the whiteness is the opening of her thighs. I'm sitting here with all the hair on my body has lifted up in, in discovering that beautiful meaning uh, of the painting. So, <laughs> um, thank you. Wow, that's, that was a very nice feeling. And so, yes, I can now see the movement because you've broken up the, the object. But I see something else, and because I know this, 
So you've told me that this is a metaphor. A body is a metaphor in your work. An object is just a metaphor. And you've now told me that this painting behind you isn't just a body. It is a body of a mother in a desert. And so this is something that has been a really hard lesson for me is to understand how you em em employ the background. The background's role together with the object in your work. Yes. Can we talk about that a bit? Yes, yes, yes. You know, that goes back to that giving and taking. And that beauty of giving and taking is that it happens in daily life, in human life, and it happens in painting. Because the moment the object started playing with the background, penetrating it, being reflected in it, opening it, the moment it opened and the background flowed in, you had that positive relationship between now an active flowing background and a receptacle, or rather the signs of a receptacle here. They were in conversation. And in their conversation, automatically, quite automatically, arose the spiritual things of giving and taking, of balance, of tensions, and of relationships. And later on I discovered interrelationships, interdependence on one another. And that's, that's all got to do with the spiritual in art, because that is, that, those are the basic human f spiritual laws and values and in life we know if we don't respect them we get more than trouble we lose respect for everything and if we observe them we can go on growing and developing i think it's as simple as that so I would just like to bring the, bring the elements together again of what we've been saying today. I've asked you about the bodies in your work, which was birds and horses and seeds. And what your, your response to that was is that those are the, are the objects in your work and that they function as metaphors. And to find the spiritual, you needed to show the relationship of those bodies, metaphors, with their environments. Um, and that is the long conversations we started having about background. And then we talked about how you break, break apart those bodies and you let the background flow into them and out of them and that the background becomes this participant in the work. And so I got it. <laughs> I was like, okay, I see it in this work behind you. The desert is as much a part of that work as that body is that's been broken apart. And then I said to you, so what? <laughs> 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 These are the difficult parts of our conversations. Well, you know what? Suddenly now, do you remember that? Y yeah, some of it I do remember. <laughs> yeah, but well, you I know... Mean, I'm I'm an, I'm an outsider artist, right? I, I don't have the education and the obsession with the technique that, that artists have who, who's been part of institutions. And so I said to you, um, well, so what? The background and the object, lovely. Okay, I've learned the lesson. Who cares? Um, please tell me how that relates to the human, to human life. Um, um, why people are frustrated with artists and all their little chats about energy and objects and backgrounds and all these things. Why should this appeal to, to just a person who doesn't have an art education? And then we came, yes, <laughs> you can answer that. Well, I don't know. It's a difficult question to answer, but I think it is, you make, if you bring, if you, if you bring those things together, you beginning to make a statement about unity. And unity is, very important. I wish I could speak more about unity, but it's basic. It is without unity, things fall apart. 
in unity there is balance, in unity there is relationships that work, in unity there is tension because otherwise things would fall apart. In unity all these spiritual things are there and I think that is very, very important. If a picture isn't one, it rattles. And if life isn't one, people go crazy or the world goes upside down. It's been pretty upside down. And there we are all quiet now in COVID-19. <laughs> I find it extremely moving how you are looking at your, uh, in retrospect, at your work and the meaning of it in this focused, painful time that we are in where we now have to recognize that what you said to me last week, that we have been using the world as our background to live on, as if it was just there to receive an object. Um, I will read this part that you said. Um, observing all this movement that happens inside of these bodies and their backgrounds um, takes me right into the powerful yet subtle place of nature. In nature, we move as objects in the space around us. In painting, the brush brings the object to a flat uh, canvas or paper, which is usually white. We, in painting, we treat the surface as a background on which the object is of major importance. Um, then in life, we are moving into a time where we are learning more about the interdependence and how a human body is part of nature. Until now, we have just been using the earth and nature as a background as a background to live on, as if it wasn't part of us. And this has been your life's work, is to show that the canvas and the object that is painted on it are not two separate things. The canvas isn't just there to receive the object. The canvas, is, the canvas and, the, and the surface and the background is part, and you, you're showing how the, the relationship between the two and how that relates to the life that, that humans live, ignoring the earth, ignoring the earth as if it's just there as a background for us to play on. Um, and I think that is the very essence of the spirituality of your work is that it's always held that message, even when you weren't seeing it, is that wake up people, the earth isn't just our background. <laughs> the earth is part of us and we are part of it. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. I'm being very dominating in this conversation. I hope everybody will but forgive you, me. But you know, but um, mm. yeah, it has been it has been, of course, my job as a pupil to 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 bring a simpler understanding to myself so that I can appreciate what it is you are teaching me, and what I need to write about you when. I'm yeah, glad you mentioned we that be because okay. you know I. I think I think the, the the link between the spiritual in art and art itself is very important, and the link between nature and man is equally important. So I love to think of a picture as a, a mirror of society, a mirror of life and. Human life, same thing. I don't know. So, <laughs> since our, uh, I mean, that this is the paragraph that we wanted to talk about. I am sort of more um, uh, wondering now if anybody else in the room would like to ask now questions in context of the, of the little tornado that we whipped up between the two of us. <laughs> Well, I think this has been one of the most enlightening sessions and the fact that a pupil of Mel or a, a mentee, I'm not quite sure how to describe your relationship, has brought things to the fore that are obviously very, very hard to articulate. These are such um, abstract concepts and, 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 and that the challenge that Mel has to, and, and to my mind, has met is to paint not objects in the traditional material sense of objects, but she has to paint concepts. And I think that is an extraordinary difficult thing to do. 
And the discussion between you and Nell have, I can't speak for, 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 for the other participants, but have certainly opened up even more uh, some of the concepts to me. So I think I also understand a little bit better. And I laughed, Robert, at your way of, um, uh, you know, really getting the most of this conversation to say that, okay, so the object and the background is one, they flow into each other, so what? You know, just your way of eliciting further discussion. I thought that was very helpful in the sense that it forces all of us to, it forces Nell to articulate it again and perhaps in a different way. And it also forces us, the other observers, to think very carefully about that. Um, so Nell did not answer that question 100% directly. So I wondered, um, I find that a breakthrough question from layman's terms. So it would be it would be kind of now to to answer just to give us some more information on that point the the the, the breaking up of the object and the flow of the object into space and space into the object. I would also like to uh, hear a little bit more clarification on that point. As I always say, in front of a picture, one can point with a finger. You see this. You see that. Okay, let's try and do it without a picture. Or we can try and use the picture next to me. I think what, what if I can interpret, is what Lizal wants to know is more, um, this. we get it now that you're bringing the object and the background into one another and showing the energy between the two. And But how does, what more of the message that that brings to us? Am I interpreting Absolutely. what, what message on. does that bring to the man in the street, as we say? Correct. It is very difficult to reply to that, but once you have broken the object, you've entered into it. If this were not a broken object, it would have been a woman lying here, this being her bum, which at the same time becomes a seed, her legs extending that way. The spine goes up all the way here. It ends in the flower, which is her head. The spine has shoulders, which become leaves growing from this seed. And with all this, this background, is entering in parts, becoming positive here and positive here and out again. So there is flow in it. There's movement from back to front, from front to back. Does that reply the question to, a, to an extent? I hope. I think that is a very good way. Thank you, Nell. It certainly does. Now, I know it must be very difficult because we are dealing with deep concepts we are dealing with intellectual concepts that perhaps to somebody who has not had the privilege in the back and, and and the background of these conversations to be quite difficult to grasp so um by your uh, doing going to an example of a painting and explaining it in basic terms so that people can first see the resemblance of the object which now becomes the metaphor it's a broken open object with many levels of metaphor, quite frankly, and your explanation, the one that you've just done, I think it makes it much easier for someone to get a foundation on which to stand and then to grasp the deeper concepts that we have been talking about. Thank you. It does answer the question. Thank you. Yeah, that is so, be that is so beautiful. I think I need to spend more time with you explaining one, uh, paintings one by one, but I suppose if we have this um, uh, formula, and if we listen to the formula, we will see it. I mean, that painting you just explained, where this woman becomes what she what she is within. She is a, a flower. She is the desert. She is, and and it's that message that we we are not separate from those things. Those shapes are in us. She talks often of how the shapes are reflected in inside of us. There's a flower in your eyes. There's a, uh, a you know, a, a tree in your spine. And, and to, to recognize the relationships between how we look like our nature, the nature and the environment that we are in will, will maybe bring it home to us that 
that we are, are we are not separate from from earth and if we kill it we're gonna die too i mean this this is where it links up so deeply with the time that we are in now thank you robert you made it so clear because it's it's going back to that one word unity one <laughs> being being one <laughs> coming close but you know i just want to still tell you one more thing and that is i've always believed that True art serves, serves this, the mysterious. And I've been busy with a mysterious thing, which is energy, which is continuous and it's flowing. And it allows us to move from place to place. And we're always moving. And everything else about us is moving, some fast, some slow. And I've discovered in painting how to paint fast movement and how to paint slow movement. I've discovered to a small extent, but still a little bit of it is there. In the horses you see fast, in this you see slow. So in the end, it is these things and, and their balances and their talking to one another, relationships, and their tensions to keep them alive so that they don't become floppy. All these things which, as we said before, are the spiritual values in art and in nature and in life, human life, and our relationships. And this is so basic, it is so part of being alive that it also forms the basis of religions. It is the spiritual basis of all the various religions. It is not religion. It goes to the bottom of religion. I hope I made it fairly clear. Is that clear? Yes, I think for me, you're talking about what, what connects everything, because we feel it. And especially I'm feeling it in the time that we are in. Everything that I'm connected to is I've been, I've been blocked away from in lockdown. And the terrible longing that I'm feeling to all the things I'm normally linked to is very, very clear. And I think that longing of being connected to what's important to me, that is the spiritual. Yes, and you are showing the connections between things. Yes, it is this continuous life stream that links us all. I mean, it is, it is life itself. Because I just wanted to pick up on, if we had a, bit, a few more <laughs> minutes, to pick up on, on the, the idea of fast, fast energy and slow energy. Well, as I said, the, the birds and the, and, and the horses are are just giving themselves over to fast energy pictures. I mean, they're there, you just carry on with them. But then when you do the human body, you are busy with slow energy. And the fast energy is usually in, in the rapid, rapid, straight or curved lines. And the slow energy is usually the gentle, quieter, rounded, yeah, rounded lines like this. So at the same time, you look at the human body, it can run fast, but it is a quiet movement that goes on in it. And if you, I made some other pictures before of the, the, the woman, it was a, it was a very well-built, hefty woman. And she was sitting and here in front, the left of the body was pushing against the right of the body. So this was not a straight line, it was a line like this and curve upon curve because she, she was fat. She looked fantastic. Gracie, she sat and her tummy was, it was a symphony of pressures against one another. As if the tummy was pressing the body this way, then the part above the tummy was pressing that way. And so you almost had a conversation between these pressures, this way and that way, this way and that way, big and small. And yeah, well, that was slow pressure. And even here you uh, have yeah. slow pressure too. <laughs> the human I body is usually for slow think, pressure uh, and plants. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think that moment where I always get to where I challenge you and I say, so what? And I just want everybody to know she, you, she taught me to say, so what? <laughs> it was one of my harder lessons when we look at, at work and, uh, you know, that's often acclaimed work. And we get to that moment where we're like, so what? And so we often practice it in our mentorship <laughs> to say, so what? And so I had a moment, a so what moment, knowing now that it's all about motion, knowing that we've broken open the object, knowing that we've brought the background into the object to show interconnectivity. And then we got to a lamp and I was like, really, that is the most static object that you've ever painted. So what? Where's the movement? Yeah, where's the... And so I'm going to read something that we distilled out of our conversation. Um, in the case of human-made objects like a lamp, the movement is observed where the light has moved out of the lamp's globe and has shot out towards the background. That light then moves the background, changes it, breaks it up and draws the shapes that it has affected back into the lamp. The lamp paintings indicate this flow. And so then I under, what I understood then was that um, I have to also pay attention a bit, knowing these secrets that you gave me, knowing these formulas that you gave me, and to stop concentrating on that object and to see that you told me that you've broken up the background. When we look at the lamps, I'm sorry we can't show them now, but everybody here has access and can go look at the lamps again and see that the shapes, the lamp has been broken up, the backgrounds have been broken up, and they, their balances become equal between them. Because if we look in real life, we see how light causes energy and motion. And so, and reflections on things, even when the, when the light's not on. And so that static object of the lamp affects its background and breaks, it breaks up what the wall looks like behind it. It breaks up what the curtains next to it looked like. And, and, and so you've broke it, you break it up for us in the painting so that we can see once again, that lamp is not standing on its own. It is having an effect on everything around it. And that is not slow energy, actually. That's a lot of energy. And you know, the difficult part was to find and see in that diffused light that a lamp normally gives, very diffused, very undefined, to find specific shapes. The light is there, but now break it into shapes and bring it back into the lamp. Yes. Ah, I think, I think I'm exhausted. <laughs>